Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now for the past week I've been testing nothing but this old Alienware machine and RTX 4060 Ti graphics cards and I thought it only made sense to finally combine the two and see what would happen. Now there are a few reasons why I wanted to do this. Mainly I wanted to see how DLSS 3 frame generation would help out an old system like this one. I also wanted to see how capable the i7-920 was at native resolution when paired with a more powerful graphics card. And I wanted to see how the 4060 Ti handled itself in a PCI Express 2.0 machine. And we've got all of those bases covered today. Now, the card I'm using is the Palette 4060 Ti. I like the design of this one. Dual fans. We've got a changeable light running across the top of this thing we can adjust the lighting using the thunder master software but perhaps my most favorite feature is palette maker now this allows us to download and print our own 3d cover and backplate for the 4060 ti this is also the card i'll be using my 1440p mega benchmark some point next week too as i want to see what this card is capable of at that resolution now there's no denying that this card splits opinions i think that's more than a fair assessment but i wanted to use it today for those aforementioned reasons at the start now the alienware the old Aurora here is more than accommodating for GPUs. It's got that big 875 watt power supply with plenty of connections, and it's got the space to slot a modern graphics card in here as well without needing to make any modifications to the chassis itself or buying any adapter cables. The i7-920 has been overclocked to 3.8 gigahertz in the BIOS, and this is going to help it a little bit but I think with four cores and eight threads, it will potentially struggle in a few modern titles. But without further ado, let's take a look at this somewhat Frankenstein PC setup to see what we can expect at native resolution and at the performance with frame generation enabled too. So for those wondering about the price, I paid £137.99 for the PC, which came with a GTX 1050. I sold this for £50, and so the machine owes me just £87.99. It's never a good idea to pair a sub £100 or dollar PC with a brand new card, especially anything like the 4060 Ti or anything with equivalent power, but it sure is fun. Let's see what this mismatched combo can do at native resolution first of all. I tested all of today's games at 1440p hoping that by giving the graphics card more to do we wouldn't have to worry too much about the cpu bottleneck the gameplay is from the overclocked i7 920 4060 ti and 12 gigs of triple channel alienware but i've got some comparative figures on screen with each result as well to see how much performance we lose in comparison to a modern i5 12400f and 16 gigs of dual channel ddr4 after the native tests i'll enable dl LSS frame generation to see if that can close the gap a little bit. So for the first game we have Cyberpunk 2077 at 1440p with the medium preset, medium textures and low crowds. Now you might be surprised to see that in some instances, some but not all, the i7-920 actually handles the 4060 Ti just fine. The graphics card at this resolution does in some circumstances become the limiting factor. It's clear that overall though it does hold this card back with 59 fps on average with the i7 920 despite the 3.8 gigahertz overclock and percentile lows of 34 and 25 respectively if we look at the comparative i5 12400f result well there's not a massive gap between the average figures about 21 fps which is less than i thought for sure but it's with those percentile lows where things are definitely more noticeable it's a far more consistent experience of course, on the newer chip. This was definitely more a uh, product of my curiosity, this video, than actually trying to prove a point. Spider-Man at 1440p with a high preset next and native resolution, of course. The i7 struggled a little bit here. This is a very CPU-intensive game and it doesn't enjoy this older architecture all that much. We saw 52 FPS on average with a 1% low of 29 and a 0.1% low of 17. The frame rate was almost doubled on average with the i5-12400F and the same can be said for the percentile lows. In fact, they were more than doubled with this modern 6-core CPU. Now, I'm not saying for a minute that the i7-920 and i5-12400F deserve to be in the same comparison video, as they aren't really in any way similar, but I was hoping that this would give you a sort of idea of 
how much performance you might lose if you chose to pair a modern and powerful card with something this ancient. The Witcher 3 Next Gen 1440p high settings, of course with the native resolution once again, the i7 managed 63 FPS on average, but it was in those busier areas where the percentile lows suffered, with a reading of 20 and 8 respectively for the 1 and 0.1% numbers. The i5 managed over 100 FPS with solid percentile lows yet again, but the i7 920 with its 4 cores, 8 threads and 3.8 GHz overclock is hanging in there and delivering a somewhat playable experience, especially in those less busy areas of the game. Now when it comes to those less intensive and esports games like Apex Legends here for example, at 1440p with the highest settings, uh, albeit with low spot shadows, we were seeing well over 100 FPS and the i7-920 was delivering a more than playable experience. Even the percentile lows were pretty solid here at 82 and 73. While the i5 did of course do much better as expected, I'd happily play this game as part of this configuration with the i7-920. And this is another example where in some situations the GPU is hitting between 95 and 100% utilization. It's nice to see that you can slot a modern card in one of these and I'd be interested to know how this would fare with say a 1366 socket i7-990X, one of the old 6 core 12 threaded chips but that is of course a video for another day. Grand Theft Auto 5 1440p very high settings with advanced graphics off. This did struggle a little bit on the older i7, particularly when it came to those percentile figures of course, but all in all, it was definitely a playable experience. Not the best, and there were certainly some dips and drops in those busier parts of town, but it was okay overall. Finally, we have Fortnite for the native resolution tests, and once again, I could happily play with this frame rate on the i7, 126 FPS on average. This wasn't worlds away from the 187 we saw from the modern i5 12400F, but again, it was with those percentile lows where things were much improved, and that's basically what you're going to see between older and newer CPUs. Perhaps the average won't always be that significantly different, but it's with those percentile lows where things count the most and where you'll notice the biggest differences a lot of the time. What I want to do now though, and this is perhaps a lot more interesting, is enable DLSS frame generation, which of course will perceive the frame rates to be smoother. I did wonder if this would perhaps make things feel a lot better if we're using such a card in an old system, and I think you'll find the results to be quite surprising. In Cyberpunk with the same settings and DLSS frame generation enabled and set to quality, look at the gap, how much it's closed in terms of those average figures. Now enabling frame generation on a 4060 Ti um, when it's running with a modern CPU doesn't make that much of a difference all of the time over native res, yet with something like an old i7-920 the performance is going to shoot up on average and our perceived FPS here is 114 FPS in comparison to the i5's 138, so the DLSS frame rates have shot up above 100 and both do feel a lot smoother to play but I think this technology definitely helps out the older CPU, even though our frame times do suffer a little bit it is a lot more consistent overall as well. Marvel Spider-Man Remastered definitely benefits from frame generation too with 94 FPS as our DLSS frame generation average and a 1% low of 53 with a 0.1% low of 37. So again, things have generally improved. This isn't quite as close, of course, as the i5, but it goes to show that if you buy a modern card like this and slap it in an old Alienware system, which you definitely shouldn't, there will be a perceived improved performance if you enable something like this. I think it's when the cheaper 40 series cards come out there, like the 4060 and whatever else comes next, that we're really going to see more of a uh, scenario that makes sense. For example, a really cheap 40 series card inside a cheap secondhand system and then DLSS frame generation enabled is going to make for a lot of interesting and perhaps otherwise mismatched PC builds. Finally, we have the Witcher 3 next gen, once again, the LSS frame generation enabled here. 
With the i5, it doesn't make too much of a difference, but it does boost our i7's perceived frame rate to over 100 FPS. There are still some problems, of course, in those busier areas because this is a pretty ancient CPU overall, but it does certainly make things feel a lot smoother. I didn't really set out to achieve anything specifically with this video. I just thought it would be interesting to see how an old chip and a modern card like this performed with frame gen on and off. And I think we've seen some pretty interesting results here. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this one, leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully I will see you all in the next one when I'll have a different card in the benchmarking PC and we'll be testing another 30 games.